to have a guest in this house that I think a great deal of. Uh, I've come to respect uh, this great man of God over the past couple years, and uh, especially our, our trip today. I got to know him a little bit more. Just love hearing his history, his story, and something I really look up to in the ministry is someone who uh, serves God faithfully for years, and this man has certainly done that, and I'm really excited uh, tonight to have him share with you what's on his heart uh, from God tonight. So if you would, would you stand to your feet with me and welcome to this platform, Dr. Claude Thomas. Well, thank you. Be seated in the presence of the Lord, would you please? And let me thank uh, Pastor Jason and Holly for the invitation to come and be with you here on the Ohio River. I love rivers. I grew up on the Tennessee River in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm just thinking, I got so excited about just being here. And I uh, just wondered if a uh, transplanted hillbilly who lives in Dallas could actually find a home here in West Virginia. And I believe I could. I believe I could. I think maybe I have. Maybe I have already. <laughs> it's really a joy to be here and uh, have the opportunity to be with Jason and Holly and rode over with them. They were so gracious as to come and pick me up. And we had the opportunity to visit and to talk and find out more about the history of North Bend Church and how all of this has transpired and what God has done. And I just have to say this to you. Any time that you see God doing something like this, and I've had the privilege of being around quite a few years and uh, had the privilege of being in a lot of different churches and a lot of different places around the world. And when you see God doing something like this, you can just know that God has put his hand upon leadership to give leadership to this. And I am so grateful for Jason and Holly and their leadership, and you should be too. Amen. <laughs> now, you know, I, I move around quite a bit when, I, when I'm talking, when I'm preaching, so I'm going to try to stay in the little pools of light that they told me that I need to be in. But if occasionally I walk way over here because I want to see you, uh, I trust it'll be all right, okay? Are you all okay? Okay. Now, here's a deal. I make this deal wherever I go and speak. Some think that preaching is a monological experience, and by that I mean one person does all the talking. And that person is doing everything. But preaching is not monological. Preaching is dialogical. <laughs> Uh, dialogical, by that I mean that it's an interactive experience. And so I sort of make the deal, if you won't go dead on me, I won't go dead on you. How's that? Are we all together? And it's all right to say, man, it won't mess me up, I promise. If you want to raise your hand and holler hallelujah, it, it's all right. Go right ahead. It won't bother me. I'm from a Baptist background, but I was raised in an active Baptist background, if you get my drift. And, and so where I grew up, there in the mountains of East Tennessee, uh, hey, well, thank you very much. Uh, where I grew up, it was not uncommon for people to get really a little animated while the preacher's preaching. Are you all with me? If you're with me, say, I am. So you thought I was going to say, say, amen. <laughs> so uh, let's, just, let's just dive in here and do this thing together for a few minutes, Okay. And, and I really want to be the kind of experience that when you leave here, that you really know that you have been in the presence of the Lord. All right? Let me ask you a question. What do you think about when you think of God? I asked you that question because the response to that question is critical to all of your life. It's been said that the most important thought you ever have is what you think when you think of God. 
And the reason for that is what you think when you think of God affects all of your life. There's not a dimension, there's not a corner of our lives. They're not impacted by how we think when we think of God. And when you, when you raise that question, you would realize that in our time, there are some divergent views of God. For example, there are some who think of God as a cosmic killjoy. They think he is the spoil sport to every party, and there's a party he's going to rain on it. Others see him as an Attila the Hun, a notorious, rigorous, fearless, terrifying kind of person who's like a bad hall monitor, who's got all these rules and regulations and, and keeps you just bound up all the time. Others see him as a sadist who's cynical and sadistic examining your every move, waiting on you to mess up somewhere so he can whack you on the head. Does that sound familiar? And then there are those who think he's a totally disinterested person who has no interest in anything that's going on. He's way off, la, la, land. You see, you've got these distorted views of God, and they're not new. They're as old as you can imagine. They've always been around, and, and so you get these distorted views, and so they filter across the horizons of humanity, and what happens is they begin to infiltrate either subtly or not so subtly into the way we think about God. It was that way when Jesus came upon the earth that people had these distorted views of God. And so when Jesus came, he came to paint a different picture of God than the people were thinking about. And it was so radical and so different that it really messed people's minds up. But he painted pictures of God that were so creative. And Jesus was a creative communicator. You study him, and he was an amazing communicator and creative. One of the things that he did so creatively was to tell stories. Don't you just love to read the New Testament and imagine that you're there with Jesus and he's talking and he's telling one of these stories and you're captivated by his communicative skills, creative, communicating, lifting your imagination, reaching into your heart, expanding your thinking. He's doing all of that by just telling stories sometimes he'd tell two or three stories in a row sometimes he'd tell one story but he'd tell stories it was his creative way of communicating and he didn't tell stories for no cause he stole told his stories because there was reason there was message there's something that he's getting across to the people that were listening to him one of the most well-known stories that jesus told is a story called the prodigal son the story of the prodigal son and and it's well well known and, and we're going to delve into it a bit for in just a minute but think about what brought that up the occasion you see jesus uh, he he was becoming well known and the bible says that great crowds many crowds were were following after him and in those crowds, there were some people that wanted to get close and listen to him. And these people were the R-rated people of society. They were the notorious ones. They were the outsiders and the outcasts. And, and, and they drew in close to listen to Jesus as he spoke because the fascination of his, of his storytelling, the the the, pre, the authority of his teaching drew their attention and they just wanted to hear more. And so when they got in close, what did Jesus do? He said, okay, I'm not going to give you the Heisman. Come on in a little closer. It's like he said, if I could, I, I would come to your house and sit down and over a cup of coffee at the kitchen table, I'd have a conversation with you. He was engaging them. But there were some other people in the crowd. They were examining Jesus. They were watching him. We just sang about new wine. 
These people had old wine skin so brittle. If you poured any new wine in there and it fermented at all, it burst those wine skins. They had their own system. They had their own morality. They had their own rules. They had all of those things, 600-plus rules. These were the snarky. I love that word, snarky. They were the snarky religious legalistic leaders, and they were watching him. And so when he, when he drew close to those outsiders, these religious snarky people begin to go through the crowd. And, and, and this word is only used a couple of times, and it's used both times in what they did when Jesus got too close to the notorious people. Then they went through the crowd, and they murmured. I don't even like the sound of that word, do you? But it's described this way. They murmured through the crowd. I wonder what they were saying. What kind of guy is this? Look who he's hanging out with. Look who he's bumping shoulders with. He's either with the wrong country club crowd or he's in the wrong bar room. Murmuring. You see, these people had a distorted view of God. When they thought of God, they didn't think of God as God is. <laughs> They thought as God as God had been imagined in their minds and made in their religious systems. And so Jesus said, okay, let me tell a story. I'm going to tell three stories. And he told a story of a lost sheep, and he told a story of a lost coin, and then he tells a story of a lost son. It's the story of the prodigal son. Probably you're familiar with it. In all likelihood, you are. I've been reading it for a long, long time. Thought a lot about it. So I thought I'd just share with you tonight for a few minutes. Is that okay? All right. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 said, And all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. And that's really when it messed up the frats, the Pharisees, and the scribes. And so Jesus told the story, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to his, uh, the, he divided to, to them his livelihood. In other words, he gave them the inheritance, everything that he had. And not many days after, the younger son gathered it all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal. The word prodigal is extravagant. With prodigal, extravagant living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields, the citizen sent him into his fields to feed the pigs, the swine, the pigs. Here you got a, you got a sad picture of a Jewish boy uh, in, in a pig pen. <laughs> that's, really, that's really hitting rock bottom for him. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose. See, he's rehearsing what he's going to say. He's rehearsing what he's going to say to his dad. And he arose and came to his father. But. Underline, circle, but. Right there, things are beginning to, they're going to change dramatically. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him, kissed him over and over again. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Pause. What's the dad going to do? What's he going to say? 
But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let's eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. I'd read this story so many times. And a few years ago, I had two unique experiences that brought this into vivid focus for me. And it's amazing how that you can read the Bible for all the years and then God puts you in a position where visually or some unique way that which you have been reading takes on a different tone and tenor to you than you've ever had it to do before. And so this happened to me with a book written by a Dutch priest and he wrote the book regarding the prodigal son. And I was, it was recommended to me and I read the book. And it caused me to reflect upon an experience that I'd had in the, in the early mid-90s. My wife and I were in Russia, and we had gone up to St. Petersburg. It had just been renamed its old name. It had been Leningrad under communist regime, but it was now St. Petersburg. And we visited the Hermitage. The Hermitage is the, is the, uh, was the ancient palace of the czars. And it became a museum. And we were walking through that museum, and I saw a portrait that captured my attention. It was a portrait by the, a portrait by the Dutch painter Rembrandt. Rembrandt had gone through an experience of his own. He had father issues, and then he went out and lived wildly, and he drew sketches around the story of the prodigal son. In his last year or two, his life was radically changed. And when his life was radically changed, he finished this masterpiece called The Return of the Prodigal. I want you to look at it on the screen. Can we get it on the screen? Here it is. I want you to look at this. Now, when Jesus told the story of, of, the, of the prodigal son, you see there are three main characters in that story. There is this one who's the prodigal. There's this one who is the elder son. But if you notice in the story, the central figure in the story is not the prodigal. The central figure in the story is not the elder brother. The central figure in the story is the father. Well, in the painting of Rembrandt, scholars tell us, students of this say that Rembrandt got it right. The focal person in this painting, and not these guys over here, and this guy is important as he is, the, the central figure by the lighting and everything is upon the Father. Because you see what Jesus was doing, he wasn't talking about the Son. The, the people didn't have a wrong conception of the Son. They didn't have a wrong conception of the elder brother. They had a wrong conception of God. And so Jesus told the story, and, and I entitled the message, A Tale of the Heart, because he wanted them to see the heart of the Father. Have you ever said a statement like this? Well, I feel like I know them because I was able to see their what? Heart. I could see their heart. And the idea is when we can see the heart of a person, we really see the person. And what Jesus was doing in that story was masterfully communicating the heart of the Father. You see, the religious leaders, they had totally missed the heart of the Father. And so they were being scowling, they were being snarky in what they were saying about Jesus because they had a misconception of the Father. Could I say to you again, the most important thought you will ever have is what you think when you think of God. Because it will affect all the rest of your life. It will affect every relationship you have. It will affect the relationship you have with your wife or your husband. It will affect the relationship you have with your children. It will affect the relationship you have with your parents. It will affect the relationship you have with the people you work with. It will affect the relationship you have with those in the church. It will affect your relationship with those who are anti-church. It will affect your relationship with everybody. So Jesus said, okay, you guys are missing this thing. Let me, let me show you the heart of the Father. And so in this 
parable in this story, he exposes for us the heart of the Father. It's a tale of the heart. Three things I want you to get about the heart of the Father that are so obvious in this. First one. If you're ready, say, I am. Okay, the first one is this. This loving heart of the Father is a heart that loves unconditionally. Loves unconditionally. Look at this. The son, that younger son. Oh, what a rascal he was. That younger son. He said to his dad, he said, Dad, what I want to do is I want my inheritance. Uh, it's just as, it's like saying, Dad, it's just, it's just as much as if you're dead. Because that's the way it worked back then. You didn't get the inheritance until the, until the papa died. I, we have four sons, and I've told them, you're not getting it until I'm dead. <laughs> so when the son went to the father and asked for his part of the inheritance, he was saying to his dad, Dad, I really, I really just don't even care whether you're alive or not. All I want is that, I want that stuff. And so the father divided it up between him and the older brother. He wanted his inheritance. Why? Because he wanted a different way of life. And he took it and he went off and he wasted it. He lived wildly, wasted all he had, and wound up in a horrible mess. Then when he came back, he had absolutely nothing. Nothing. Now, what about the father? See, the central figure is the father. Here the boy is. He's coming back. He's gone off. He's wasted everything, just like I knew he would, you know. But that father's not like that. The father saw the son while he was a long way off. I want to ask you a question. Why did Jesus point that out? It's like I was preaching down in South Texas at a conference, and there was a black preacher there. Dr. Cutchum was a great, great preacher. And I was following him, and he was preaching this. And I, I've taken this right out of him. Doctor, no, Dr. Branch, Dr. Harold Branch. I'm taking this right. I'm just lifting it off. He said that daddy, and I'm not going to do it like he did because I can't. He said that daddy would go down to the mailbox every day, and he'd look down that dusty road and wonder, is my boy coming home today that longing patient waiting heart he saw him when he was afar off and he had compassion it's an interesting word it means that he moved in there and he felt everything that boy was feeling but it was more than empathy he was in there with him he wasn't feeling for him, or he wasn't feeling with him, he was in it. He was in it. And then that, that patriarch jerked up his robe and took off running, showing his front legs, and they didn't do that, but he did. Here he's running. And when he gets to his son, he falls on his neck. I have four grown boys and they're men and when I see them now even now I fall on their neck and I kiss them and they're on the neck and they kiss me on the neck and it's just great this father he ran and he threw his arms around his boy and fell on his neck and the text says the Greek text says he began to kiss him over and over and over and over again what is it that heart of God erupting with love. Wow. Think about that. It is love. It's unconditional love. Annabelle Gillum is a writer there in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area where we live and, and has been one of the, used to be one of the uh, speakers on a ladies circuit. And she, they have, she and Bill have four sons and second son's named Mason and Mason 
was born with all kinds of challenges and, and to the point that the day came that they couldn't keep him at home and they had to institutionalize him so he could be cared for and they'd bring him home. And, 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 and Annabelle tells of one time when he was home and, and, and it was about to go back to his other home and, and she, he, he just sat there and just looked at her. And she got down and she said, Mason, I love you. Mason, I love you so much. Mason, can you give something to back to me? I'm your mother. Annabelle had been raised in such a way that she thought that she had to perform for people to love her. And she said, when I stood there brokenhearted, trying to get Mason to give something back to me because I loved him so much. She said, God broke through. Said, Annabelle, Mason's here drooling and he can't wipe the drool off of his face and he sits in a dirty diaper and he can't feed himself. He can't do anything and he can do nothing for you. He can't even respond to you and you love him so much. Annabelle, I want you to know that's the way that I love you. Can't you just give something back to me? I'm telling you, listen to me, God loves you and me like that. You see, unconditional uh, love warps us, and it wounds us. And then we live with hurt, and we live with hang-ups, and we live with bad habits because we have been conditioned to think that we have to perform to be loved. I want to say something to you. You don't have to perform to be loved by God. His love is unconditional. And where you've been wounded and hurt, He heals. His love is a healing love. It's a helping love. It's an elevating love because it is unconditional love. See, my goal tonight is for us to see this love so we can experience this love so our lives can be elevated. See it? Paul said in Romans chapter 5, but God put his love on display. Put his love on display. Actually, the word is he stood his love up for everybody to see it like a sign. And when he put it up for everybody to see it like a sign, his love was a, the sign of a cross. <laughs> for chance, a, a man might give his life for a friend, but for enemies and sinners and people who are giving God this. But he did. So we could see. When you look at the cross, there's one thing you've got to see. You've got to see the unconditional love of God. You can see it. There it is on the cross. You can see it. There it is stood up for you and me to see across all history, all time and eternity. It's there. How do I experience it? Could I just tell you quickly? It's not hard. We just, need to get it, we just need to get it right because we're talking about the heart of God. The heart of God, we make, we make this thing way, 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 way too hard. Here's the way it happens. I see it, I take a step. I step across the line of faith, and I do a transfer. I transfer my trust from myself to the one who loves me unconditionally. And when I do that, I promise you, I promise you, you'll be on a journey where the unconditional heart of God's love you will experience. Have you? You see, he told the story so we could see and experience the unconditional love of God. It's a heart that loves unconditionally. Ready for number two? If you're ready for number two, say, say I am. Y'all are doing great. Thank you. You're doing great. I'm, 
I'm happy. Maybe your pastor will invite me back sometime. Uh, number two, not only is the heart shown that loves unconditionally, but it's a heart that forgives completely. Forgives completely. Just go back to the narrative. The son had broken his father's heart. And if you look at verses 18, 19, and 21, you'll see that not only had broken his father's heart, but he says that I have I've sinned against heaven and against you. And the word there, sin, means to fall short of a mark. And it means the mark, when you hit the mark, you get everything that's there for you. And if you don't hit the mark, you lose what is there for you. It's to fall short. It's, it's not just to fall short. It's to lose. And so what he said, I, 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 the inheritance I got, uh, but I wasted it and I've sinned, but I have sinned in that I have fallen short of who I could be, who you think I could be, who you know I could be, who you want me to be, who you've given everything that you've got so I can be, and I've blown it. That's what he said. I'm going to go tell my dad that. And I'm going to ask him if he'll just take me in as a hired servant. I don't have any sandals now. That's the way slaves were. And I'll just go be a slave. I'm eating, I'm eating the same things. I would eat what they feed these pigs if they would let me, but they don't. And, and I'm going to my father. He's, he's got hired servants. They're in better shape than I am. I'm going, to, I'm going home. And I'm going to confess and just see if there's some way he might just let me squeak in and have a little place over here somewhere over here so that I can just, you know, I can just get by. That's what he's saying. Here's what I want to say. We've missed the mark too. Have we not? We've missed the mark. The boy had missed the mark. What's next? He's coming home. The father sees him. Loves him unconditionally. What about forgiveness? Is he going to put him on probation for six months and see how well he does? And if he does well, I'll, I'll, give him a, I'll give him a place with one of the servants. But let's not rush into this thing too much. Let's not be too quick to judgment. After all, we're, 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 we're you know, I'm, t I'm strong. I'm strong. Is that what happened? <laughs> Not on your life. You see, that's how people picture God. And he's not like that. I just tell you, God's not like that. The father said to his, high, to his servants, he said, go get the, not a, not, not, not a slave robe, go get that robe that has been reserved for my boy, that best robe. And let's put that robe on him. He's not going to run around here tattered and torn like this. And get a ring. The ring signified that he was in the family and had authority. Put the ring on his hand. And oh, by the way, put some sandals on the boy's feet. He's not a slave in my house. He's a son. He's a son. How does God deal with you? You see, we have more trouble forgiving ourselves than God does having, he doesn't have any trouble forgiving us. I come to him and I say, God, look, I am so messed up. Gosh. Picture the heart of God forgives completely. I was a teenager. And I'd gotten to be man enough that I bought my own car. I had a 55 Chevrolet. I wish I still had that Chevrolet. My dad was lying on the sofa. He was sick. And he said something to me and asked me to do something. I just ignored my father. I walked out of the living room through the kitchen 
out on the back porch down the steps, got in my car and started to drive off, just totally ignored my sick father lying there. He wasn't sick in the sense that he was not able to do anything, but he was just having something like the flu. I don't remember what it was. He didn't say a word. I got in my car and started down the road and went down the end of the street and started down the hill, and when I did, my mind began to flood with memories. I remember being an eight-year-old boy wanting to play baseball so badly I couldn't hardly stand it. And my dad coming home after he got home from work and driving in in his truck. He worked for an engineering company, and he'd drive in, and he'd get out of that truck, and he'd say, go get the ball and get the mitt, get the glove. My dad had made a, made a, a home plate just like in Little League. See, I wasn't old enough to play. I just wanted to play. My dad had stepped off how far it was from the pitcher's mound to the catcher's, to the home plate. See, I wanted to be a catcher. I didn't want to stand out in right field or left field and wait for interminable amounts of time for something to happen. I wanted to be where the action was. And there's only two places on a baseball team where there's a lot of action. One's pitcher's mound and the other's catcher. So my dad, I thought about that. When I was eight years old, I was putting on a uniform because I was good enough to make the team. I just wasn't old enough to play. I thought about my dad. He's what made that happen. I thought about times he came in and said, you want to go to the mountains? <laughs> let's, go, let's go catch some trout. I thought about the times that my dad spent endless, horrific experiences teaching me how to use a fly rod, how to catch trout. I thought of all those times. I got down to the bottom of the hill, and all of those things and more flooded my mind. And I thought, you are an absolute jerk. I turned that car around and read his grocery store a lot <laughs> pretty fast. You know, you just jab it up in second gear and hit it and drop the clutch, and it would, it would, it would go. And so I just did that. I was mad at myself. I drove up the hill, pulled down into the backyard where I'd parked the car, went back up the steps, across the back porch, through the kitchen, into the living room. My dad was still lying there. I got down on my knees. I said, Dad, I am so sorry. Will you forgive me? My dad said, son, before you got out of this room, you were already forgiven. My dad was a tough guy. Listen to me. He, he was a disciplinarian. He was a tough guy. He told me one time, he said, if you draw that hand back, I'm going to put your head where your feet just left. truth but you see when my dad released me just like that I was a free person I was free I was free God doesn't want you bound up he doesn't want you burdened down he doesn't give a partial forgiveness he doesn't give a delayed forgiveness. How does he forgive us? He give, forgives us completely, completely. Jesus showed this story so that the people could see the heart of God that forgave completely. The tax collector, sure, forgive them. The, the prostitute, sure, forgive them. The, 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 the thief, sure, forgive them. Uh, the, the person who's, who's trying to make it, forgive them. Yeah, forgive them. The person who's messed up like Peter, forgive them. What he's doing. Here's the word forgive. Please get this. The word forgive in common vernacular means to let it go. And God says, 
My heart says, you come to me, you say, I'm sorry, I messed up. He doesn't want you to walk around burdened down with guilt and shame. That is what the devil will do to you. He'll beat you to death with guilt. He'll beat you to death with shame. He'll make you feel so guilty. He'll make you feel so ashamed. You won't be able to get your head up. Of course you messed up. Yes, it was bad. But let me tell you something. God's grace is greater than the worst thing that anybody has ever done. And the heart of God forgives come. Completely. Don't you dare walk out of here tonight carrying a burden. Don't do it. The heart of the Father, the tell of the heart is He loves unconditionally. He forgives completely. You ready for number three? If you are, say I. Yes. He celebrates extravagantly. He said, this is... This. He said, we've been, we, we put this calf up, and we put this calf up, and, and, and we fed it grain. We fed it the best. We, 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 we prepared this calf to have the best steaks that you could ever imagine, the best roast you could ever imagine, the best tenderloins you could ever imagine. It's got it all. That, that, and, and, and I want you, I've been saving it for a party, and I want you to go get that. But get the fatted calf. Let, let's slaughter that calf and let's prepare for a party and let's be merry. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the heart of God like? Sad, sadistic, not snarky? No. The heart of God says, I see you coming. I see what you need. And I want you to know it's my joy. It's my joy. Have you ever read in the Bible where it says that God sings over you? <laughs> that's, a, that's the heart of God. God wants to celebrate you. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to celebrate you. He doesn't want you to beat you down. He wants to lift you up. And when we move to Him, <laughs> He just celebrates he just celebrates let me ask you where are you tonight celebrate perhaps you're here and you came in a little beat now carrying a little something. I don't know about you, but when I do, when I mess up, it, it bothers me. And if I'm not careful, I can get down on myself. You see, I, I, I've been studying the Bible for 50-some-odd years. And, and all four of the guys are pretty good students of Scripture. We get together, we talk about, we talk about it. So, you know, it's not foreign to me. You understand what I'm saying? It's not foreign to me. I do understand. But sometimes I do not embrace. Here's what I want you to do tonight. <laughs> I want you to embrace the Father. Embrace his heart. Sometimes... I know you guys aren't like this, but I am sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I wish I could say I was always just perfect with my wife. But sometimes I'm overloaded, and I think, and sometimes I may say something I shouldn't say or I may respond in a way I shouldn't respond. I know you guys don't do that, but I do. And my wife says, you're my hero.
It's over. It's over. God says, you're my hero. I love you. You can't do anything to make me love you more or make me love you less. I love you unconditionally. I forgive you completely. It's raced. The board's clean. There's nothing there. And if you can imagine how far the east is from the west, that's how far he gets rid of those things. They're not there anymore. I'm sorry, it's gone. I love you unconditionally. I forgive you completely, not a smidgen. I won't bring it up and throw it back in your face, ever. So let's go on down the road together and celebrate the good things that I want to do in your life. Could it be that you needed just to see the heart of the Father tonight to encourage you to elevate you or maybe to lead you to step across that line of faith where you put your trust for the very first time in Jesus who takes you by the hand and attaches you to the Father would you bow your heads please I don't know exactly how to lead you to do what you need to do, but I want you to be able to respond right where you are from your heart to his heart. For with the heart, man believes. So your heart, not that fist size organ that pumps the blood through your body, but that center of all your decision-making, your religious bent, your emotional turns, all of that, that center of your life. Tonight, do you need to transfer trust to him? Tonight, tonight. I, I don't know you. I don't know you. If you do, right where you're seated, just, just acknowledge to the Lord that that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Uh, I'm, I'm trusting you right now, Lord. I'm trusting you right now. I can't help it. I got to do this. If that's you with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to do something. You don't have to do any more than this. I just want you to look up to me up this way and say as an indication, I, I've transferred my trust to the Lord tonight. Your head's about Just look up this way. Look, yeah, 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 it's good. Yeah, I see you. Uh, here in the middle. Yes, okay. Others here in the middle. How about over here on this side? Just look. Yeah. 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 God bless you. And, and maybe you've walked in as a believer and you're carrying a load. And you, you're going to walk out here free of that load, celebrating. You're not going to carry it anymore. You're going to give it to the Lord. He, he, he's, he's reaching out from his heart to your heart said, let me take that. Let me have it. Let me have it. You don't have to pay for it. I've already paid for it. You don't need to carry it. Let me, let me have it. Let me have it. Father, you know every one of us. You know where we are. You know what's in our lives. You know these who said, I, by just looking up, I, I'm going to transfer my trust tonight to Jesus. To these who carrying loads that they don't want to carry that uh, 
is is beating them up and it's a beat down for them and life is tearing them down right now god i pray for them they will experience the freedom of complete and total forgiveness where god says i let that go now you let it go so we can live in freedom thank you that you celebrate with us who we are decisions we make the purpose you have for us the future that is ours because you are indeed a good good father we thank you in Jesus name amen I think the band ought to come back out what do you all think huh <clears throat> come on come on band because I think we need to sort of celebrate. All right? Are you all good with that? Okay. Ben, pastor, is this okay? All right. Call me down if I'm going too far. But let me go and call me down later, okay? All right. All right. Let's all stand and let's just celebrate what God has done in our midst and we'll do it through singing. But before we do, I want you to give the Lord a great hand and tell him that you love him and who he is.
about this church. Sing this out. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me. No shadow. While they're singing, I don't want to stop singing. I want you to continue. But here's what I do want to say. There are two things that I want, to, I want us to leave with. Number one, we have four grown men. My sons are men. I mean, they're men's men. They're great men. My prayer is that I will always show to them the heart that I've experienced from God. And could I say to you men tonight, all the men in the house, listen to men, look at me. Show unconditional love to your wife and to your children. And if you've got grandchildren, God help us show them unconditional love. Be a person of unconditional love. That's the biggest man, the strongest man you can be. And you can only be that by the grace of God, by the way. So as you attach your heart to his heart, he'll give you the heart to love unconditionally. Number two, don't hold any grudges. Don't hold any grudges. It creates bitterness. It creates resentment. If you got daddy issues tonight, get over them. Can I be so bold as to say that? Because here's what I know about men. I speak to men all over this world. Let me tell you something. What I know, men got daddy issues. I talked to one of the most prominent sports figures that's walked across the pages in the 20th century. And I sat and talked to him, and he said, let me tell you something. I was in a rehab center for all that time, and now I want you to know that most of the men in that rehab center got daddy issues, Claude. You don't have to have daddy issues. Let them go. You've got God the Father who will give you the heart that you need and be the daddy. The Bible says he's a father to the fatherless and, fa I mean, to the fatherless and he's a husband to those who have no husband. Could I just say to you? And guys, don't get so wrapped up in life that you don't take time to celebrate. I was talking to my wife just before uh, Jason picked me up. We're getting ready to go to Virginia. My, our second son's second daughter is getting married. That's our first grandchild. Our whole family's going. And I've rented a beach house. I may have to come back and ask for a big honorarium. But I, <laughs> I've rented a beach house. I've rented one. And we're all going to get together. And I was talking to my wife just before we came. I came over here. She said, I was just talking to Brandon. That's our, that's our third son. 
going to be here next week. He, I just talking to him, and he was saying, Mom, we got to do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this. And we're, i tell you what we're going to do. All 20-some odd of us, all of our grandchildren, our sons, and our daughters-in-law, we're all going to get together. And you know what? We're going to celebrate little Elizabeth getting married. We're going to celebrate that. But we're going to celebrate a family that knows what it's like to live under the grace of God. Don't, guys, let me just say it to you. Don't leave here without it. Guys, listen to me, please. Do it. Do it. Attach to the heart of God and express that heart. Particularly to your wife and to your children. I just had to say that. I hope it's okay. And if you miss supper, see me after it's over. I got a $20 bill. I'll give it to you. Okay? All right. Let's finish it out. Y'all are doing great. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I couldn't help it. There's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down you're coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up you're coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down you're coming after me yes no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, fire you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, fire you won't tear down. Church, would you give him a shout of praise tonight in this place? <laughs> he is good. He is good tonight. I tell you what, I feel like we've been to church tonight. Amen. Anybody feel like we've been to church? Well, I truly believe that God has used Dr. Claude tonight to speak to our heart in a great and awesome way, and I'm thankful thankful for you tonight certainly have you back certainly have you back anytime uh, man after a night like tonight you almost don't want to leave you know you really don't um, but I know that we have another one of these coming up next week amen you excited about that and, and, it, and it's got to be good because it's Claude's son so it has to be good it has to be good Brandon Thomas pastors a great church Keystone Church in uh, Texas as well. So we are excited to have him. But what I'd love to do is send us off tonight uh, just with prayer. We're going to keep playing. But also, I'm going to have Brandon come up in a few moments and uh, share with you guys a few things. Did you enjoy yourself tonight? Amen. All right. Let's close this thing out tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your great love for us, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for this word that's been spoken to our heart tonight. I've been refreshed. I've been refreshed personally, Lord, and I, I know that this congregation has been refreshed as well. So I just pray that you would continue to do a great and mighty work through this month, Lord, through every speaker, every word that comes, God. I just believe in that it's going to be a great and mighty thing in each and every one of our hearts, Lord. God, I just pray for each and every one as we go out tonight from this place that we'd be empowered, 
to speak your word to others, Lord God, that we would invite to this house, but also, Lord God, we'd have the opportunity to invite others to know who you are, as Savior and Lord. I pray, God, you would encourage us to do so as we go from this place tonight. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, guys, continue to give it up. Give the Lord one more shout of praise. Thank you, Dr. Claude Thomas, for that awesome word. Definitely timely for our house in this season. All right, guys, I want to talk about the swag bag one more time. Don't forget your water bottle and the selfie challenge. Use that hashtag summer session selfie. Don't forget to stop by the photo booth. Also, that would be a good place to maybe do a couple trial selfies. Get yourself ready. Um, I don't know about you guys, but that was an awesome start to summer session. I might not sleep until next Wednesday. I'm so pumped right now. Um, if you have a home church, like Pastor Jason mentioned, we do have some visitors tonight. You know, please continue to attend your home church. However, if you're a guest tonight and you don't have a home church, please feel free to come check out North Bend Church this weekend, Sunday at 9 a.m. and at 1030. So you can either come early or sleep in, either or. So come check us out. Also, if you'd like to just get a little bit more information about North Bend Church, stop by the Connection Point, which is the big orange room as you exit to my right, your left, and we will have some literature there about our church. Summer session, week two, as they mentioned, Brandon Thomas next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We can't wait. Selfie challenge. See you guys soon. Love you.